I want to sell you a car. Isn't it gorgeous? It's got the best gas mileage of anything on the market today. All the high-end specialty services that you want, they're in this car. It's exactly what you need to get you where you're going. And I know that's why you came here today, was to get something like this. In fact, I've sold one to every person in your situation that's come to see me for the last several months at least. Now, there is one downside. I mean, we can sell you this car today. You can drive it home. We'll figure out the qualifications and all the financing sometime in the future. But if it turns out that you don't actually qualify to buy this car and you keep driving it, that amazing gas mileage that it has is really going to start to drop off. In fact, that's not just for your car or even just for the cars that I've sold to people around here. That's for all of these cars all around the world. The manufacturer is even saying now that perhaps if we keep accidentally giving these cars to people that don't really qualify for them, they're eventually just going to stop starting altogether. And there's one other thing. I probably shouldn't even mention it. It almost never happens. But uh, if you happen to drive this car and not qualify, there's this off chance that you'll develop a really nasty limp that you're going to have for the rest of your life. But you're still interested, right? So I know this sounds like a ridiculous situation, but this is more akin to one of the most important situations that we're facing in our healthcare system today than you might realize. Take a minute and think about the last time that you went to see your primary care physician because you weren't feeling well. Maybe you had a cold or your allergies were acting up. Maybe it was even the dreaded flu. Try to think back and remember what did you want in that moment out of that interaction so that you would feel like you'd been well cared for and gotten some value for your copay. If you're like most Americans, you wanted more than just some reassuring words. In fact, recent studies have shown that Americans are looking for either an in-office treatment, a referral to a specialist, or a prescription to take home in order to leave happy from their doctor's office. According to a 2016 study, over 90% of providers are feeling that pressure and giving in. 90% of general care practitioners have given patients a prescription even if they didn't really want to. And 70% of those prescriptions were for antibiotics, even if the provider couldn't tell exactly what infection the patient had, or even if they had one at all. And within that, 50% of the time, these prescribers had been giving antibiotic prescriptions even when they knew that the patient probably only had a cold or the flu, which are diseases caused by viruses, and antibiotics won't help those. So this is a pretty staggering thing to stop and think about, especially when you realize that there are over 260 million courses of antibiotics prescribed each year in the United States. That's enough for five out of every six Americans to get a course of antibiotics every year. And according to a recent study, one out of every three of those courses of outpatient antibiotics is either inappropriate or completely unnecessary. And don't think that this is just doctor's offices or the outpatient side. Hospitals are suffering the same issues when it comes to antibiotic misuse. The World Health Organization says that over half of the patients admitted to U.S. hospitals receive at least one dose of an antibiotic during their stay. And that same report goes on to say that half of those antibiotics are, again, either unnecessary or inappropriate. All of this antibiotic misuse on both the inpatient and the outpatient side, it's not without consequences. The more we expose bacteria to antibiotics without appropriately killing them, or overuse these antibiotics, the more the bacteria become accustomed to them, they evolve, and they become more resistant. In fact, each year, over two million Americans become infected with bacteria that are resistant to the first line of antibiotics that we would choose to treat them. And those resistant infections, those resistant infections, 
They cost our healthcare system over $20 billion in excess healthcare costs and lead to 23,000 deaths each year. So with all of this talk that you see in the media recently about so-called superbugs, these incredibly resistant bacteria for which there's no treatment and people are dying every day, you might start to think that this is a really modern problem that we're facing. But in fact, that's just not true. In fact, this gentleman, Sir Alexander Fleming, the man who discovered penicillin and the father of modern antibiotics, he called this one 72 years ago in an interview that he gave with the New York Times in 1945. To paraphrase, what Dr. Fleming said was that as people become more accustomed to this idea of antibiotics, they're going to start thinking that they need them, maybe even when they don't, and they're going to start asking for them specifically. And as we start handing out these antibiotics more and more, the bacteria are going to continue to evolve and grow, and they're going to get smarter. And eventually, the antibiotics that we have just aren't going to work anymore, and people are going to start to die. We've seen that exact scenario that he talked about play out over the last eight decades. This graph is an example of perhaps the most commonly discussed resistant bacteria. It's called methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. You've probably heard about it. It's most commonly referred to as MRSA in the public. Okay? MRSA is not special in any way. It doesn't show some unusual trend. In fact, it's actually pretty typical of what we're seeing with all bacteria around the world. And that is, as we expose them more and more to these antibiotics, a higher and higher percentage of them are becoming resistant to those antibiotics, and we're having to move on to find new treatments, and those treatments are difficult to come by. But what's the big worry? Big Pharma is going to come and just save us all, right? It's not a big deal. They're just going to create some new antibiotics, and they'll just treat the resistant bacteria that way. Yeah, if only it was that simple. First of all, we need to talk about the fact that it takes an extremely long amount of time to develop a new drug, especially an antibiotic, sometimes as much as a decade from inception to actually hitting the market. Then there's the fact that antibiotics really don't make money for the drug companies. Think about the way that medications are used to treat things like high blood pressure or diabetes. Typically, when a patient starts one of those, they take them for the rest of their lives. That's in direct contrast to the way that we use antibiotics, where the patients usually only take them for a few days or maybe a few weeks. It's much harder for the drug companies to make a profit when you're taking something for days instead of decades. And then there's the fact that when we do finally get some new antibiotics to come to market, the prescribers that write for them, they usually squirrel them away and keep them only for their sickest patients, only bringing them out when absolutely necessary so that they don't fall victim to these same resistance patterns that we're seeing with other antibiotics. So when you add all these things up, it's no surprise that over the past 35 years, we've seen the rate of new antibiotics hitting the US market drop from roughly four per year down to only one every other year. Please don't get me wrong. I am not saying that we need to stop using antibiotics. Far from it. Antibiotics are miraculous things. They are life-saving medications that we use every day in the healthcare system to save people and to treat them. But in order to do that, we need to use them appropriately. Something has to change in the cavalier attitude with which we're currently treating them. Think about the rainforest or rare animals, any number of more popular things that have become rare and endangered over the last several decades. When we see these things happening, we all band together as a united people and we say, we need to stop this before we lose these precious things. And often these, uh, often these tasks of moving towards preserving them are referred to as stewardship. So we find ourselves at a crossroads. We now realize that creating new antibiotics is probably not going to be able to occur fast enough to keep us up with the bacteria as they evolve. And so we have to forge a new path, and that new path is called antimicrobial stewardship. 
So antimicrobial stewardship is defined a lot of ways, but it's often that we look at the fact that we need to not only use antibiotics appropriately, but we need to monitor that utilization and see where we're going, see if it's making any improvement. And the major goal of this stewardship effort is that we have good clinical impact, we're getting good effectiveness out of the antibiotics, and we're not seeing any of the negative consequences, whether that be toxicities or increases in resistance. So in its most simple terms, Antibiotic stewardship can be described as patients getting the correct drug to treat the specific type of infection that they have and the specific bacteria with which they're infected. To do that, we need to give them the correct dose and give it via the most appropriate route, whether that be oral or injection or something else. And we need to use these antibiotics for the shortest amount of time possible to still be effective. So now that we have a general understanding of where we stand and how we're stacking up against the bacteria, how can we as individuals, as patients, and as just people in this world, become stewards of antibiotics specifically, but of our healthcare in general? Let's go back to that car lot where we started and see some specific tasks that we might be able to take. Really, the first question that we need to answer is, do I even need a new car to begin with? Do I have an infection at all? And if I do, is it the type of infection that an antibiotic can treat? Remember, antibiotics only treat bacteria. But things like the common cold or the flu, those are caused by viruses, and antibiotics won't treat them. Then there's the fact that things like coughs, runny noses, ear infections, bronchitis, even though these are often caused by minor bacterial infections, they're often what's considered self-limiting, meaning that a healthy person in general, with good nutrition and some rest, they can fight off those infections without actually needing an antibiotic at all. So what we need to start doing is having these conversations with our healthcare providers. We need to start establishing a role of, do we need an antibiotic, or is it possibly better to take a stance of watchful waiting. Give it a few days, see if we get better instead of starting that antibiotic on day one. Not all antibiotics kill all types of bacteria. It's very important that whenever possible, we have our healthcare providers collect a culture of some cells from our body that they can send to a lab so they can grow the specific bacteria that's causing the infection that we have. That bacteria can be identified by the lab and then tested against a myriad of antibiotics to see which ones kill it best. Once the provider has that type of information, they can be very specific in selecting the most appropriate antibiotics to kill the bacteria that's infecting our body without accidentally causing some of the other unintended consequences. So as patients, we need to get more accustomed to the idea that perhaps in the middle of the course of antibiotics that we've been prescribed, the phone's gonna ring, and we're gonna get a call from the doctor saying, you know, I need you to stop that one and go back to the pharmacy. I know it's gonna be another copay, but this is important. We need to change the antibiotic that you're on so that we can be the most targeted and selective that we need to so that we can be healthier people overall and get you healthy as soon as possible. Dosing antibiotics is not a trivial task. Not only do we need to take into account the fact that even the same antibiotic might have different doses to treat different bacteria and different uh, infections around your body, but you also need to make sure that you always share with your healthcare provider what medications you're taking, even if those are over-the-counter medications or supplements, because that sort of information could really play into the way that antibiotics are dosed. We also need to realize the fact that every once in a while, we might need some blood work to figure out how well our organs are functioning, specifically our kidneys and our liver. And every once in a while, we also need to get blood work to monitor antibiotics to see that we're getting the appropriate levels in our body by taking the doses we are without causing toxicity to us, but while still killing the bacteria appropriately. 
So now that we've established that we need to take the right dose of antibiotic and that we need to use it in the most appropriate way possible, we need to talk about how long we take those antibiotics. Certain antibiotics can be used to treat things such as simple urinary tract infections in as quick as three days, but some more complicated infections such as those in the bones sometimes require treatment for weeks or even months. We need to be able to have open conversations again with our providers to discuss, do I really need this prescription for 14 days or even 10 days? Is there a shorter treatment course that I could be on that would be just as efficacious but won't put me at risk for any of the downside that antibiotics can bring? And finally, be nice to your healthcare providers. They have your best interest at heart. They want you to be happy and healthy as much as you do. Don't pressure them into giving you a prescription for an antibiotic or for any other medication for that matter. Study after study, year after year, we've seen that they'll probably just give it to you if you ask. And that's not good for you, and it's not good for the rest of the world. So going forward, be stewards of your antibiotics. Take an active role in your health care. Openly discuss with your health care providers whether you have a real infection that can be helped by an antibiotic, what dose of antibiotic what you need to treat that infection, and what's the shortest amount of time that you can be on that antibiotic while still getting a good outcome. In doing this, you can too become an antimicrobial steward. Thank you.